Hello and welcome to the 13th installment of my Pokemon Generation 3 ROM hacking series. The focus of this tutorial is to show off some scripting tips, time efficiency tool tips, and to address some mistakes I've made throughout the past 6 tutorials. This video will be broken down into the following segments. What are your tool tips for quicker scripting? What are some extra commands that I should know about? And what mistakes have you made that I should be aware of? There will not be an application demonstration after the bulk of this tutorial. This video is meant to serve as a wrap-up video to the past six tutorials, all dealing with scripting. My first tip actually deals with mapping instead of scripting. I forgot to add it to my first advice in a route of video, so I'll talk about it now. When we edit maps in Advanced Map, clicking on every individual tile then placing it on the map can get very tedious. Luckily, we can speed up the mapping process by selecting and pasting a bunch of tiles at the same time. To do this, hold the Control key and the right click button, then drag your mouse to make a rectangle around the tiles you want to copy and paste in bulk. These tiles will be added to the grocer block. From here, simply left click on the map and all of the tiles that were in the grocer block will be pasted. You can copy from both the list of tiles to the right of the window or from the map itself. All movement permissions will be copied and pasted along with their respective tiles. My second tip is something that will speed up the scripting process. I didn't even know about this feature until just recently, which is why I never mentioned it in my message box tutorial. I've created a small script that's just supposed to display some dialogue. I haven't written any dialogue yet, as you can see under the at talk pointer. In fact, I haven't even added the equals character yet. We're going to add some dialogue here without having to manually insert the slash n, slash l, and slash p escape characters. To do this, click the Tools menu item, then click Text Adjuster. A white box should pop up. Let's add some dialog. The different lines of text will be cut off when the in-game text limit is reached. If you want to add separate paragraphs to your dialog, hit Enter twice. Once you're finished, click the Convert button. This will add the equals symbol, as well as all of the necessary escape characters to make your dialog look good. Clicking the Clear button will erase everything you've written. Clicking the Insert button will paste all of the converted text wherever your cursor is at in XSE. This isn't an extremely important tool, mind you, but if you don't want to have to add the escape characters by yourself, it could come in handy. Next, I'm going to go over some extra or more obscure commands that I don't foresee myself talking about in any future tutorials. Hopefully this way I can get most of the commands in without having to make things complicated in other videos. The Check Gender command checks the player's gender. If the player is male, the variable last result will store the value 0x0. If the player is female, last result will store 0x1. Shown on screen is a sample script that displays different dialog depending on which gender the player chose. The give egg command gives an egg to the player. It takes a single parameter, that being the hex value of the Pokemon to give. Shown on screen is an example script of the player being given a Squirtle egg. The wait state command can be used after the special command. I talked about the special command and its various uses back in my mobility scripting tutorial. The script shown on screen initiates Groudon's orb glow effect using the command special 0x119. The wait state command is used immediately after this to tell the script to wait for the animation to finish before continuing execution. This is similar to how you need to use the wait movement command after the apply movement command for a pause to be apparent. The wait key press command simply halts script execution until the player hits any key on his or her keyboard. Shown on screen is a sample script in which the player must push a key in order to end the interaction. The last couple of commands I want to discuss are the lock all and release all commands. We've been using lock and release commands since the very first scripting tutorial. They lock the player and release the player respectively. The lock all and release all commands, on the other hand, lock and release every NPC on the map. This is useful in various situations, but I'll let you be the judge of that. Next up is the list of errors I've made on the past six tutorials or details I need to elaborate some more on. Cue the playback. Be aware that this will make all other event types disappear, so if you want to edit other events, you must switch back into the original view. Ignore the unknown values, they don't do anything. At any given moment, the player can see exactly 7 tiles to the left, 7 tiles to the right, 5.5 tiles upward, and 5.5 tiles downward. There aren't many topics I need to deal with here, thankfully. 
The first one is something that I meant to talk about in my first Advice in Arata video, but ended up forgetting to do so. Be aware that this will make all of their event types disappear, so if you want to edit other events, you must switch back into the original view. I said that you can't show both the physical sprite for a person event along with the other events at the same time if you click on the show sprites button on the top of advanced map. This is true unless you do something else. Click on the settings menu item, then uncheck the hide other events option. Now you should be able to switch the physical sprites for the person events on and off without making the other event types disappear. The next mistake is something more interesting. Ignore the unknown values, they don't do anything. Even though the first unknown box has been researched and concluded to do absolutely nothing, it was brought to my attention by one of my viewers that the first unknown box actually corresponds to the tile height or elevation. I discussed elevations back in my second tutorial called Map Diversity. We can use this unknown value for things like activating a script event if the player is above a bridge tile instead of below it. Take Emerald's Victory Road for instance. I placed a script event on the bridge as shown on screen. The red ceiling tiles are just to indicate where things are in game. When the player steps on the script event, it will activate and display some dialog. Let's first test this event with the unknown value fixed at zero. If the player steps on the bridge tile while underneath it, the script activates. Okay, so now what if we were to step on it while on top of the bridge? It still activates. The issue should be clear to you now. What if we only want the script event to activate when the player is on top of the bridge? Have a look at the Movement Permission tab. The ground below the bridge has an elevation of 2, denoted by a purple C. The ground attached to the sides of the bridge has an elevation of 3, denoted by a green 10. The unknown value of our script event is currently set at 0. Setting this value to 0 will make it so that, no matter what the elevation the player is currently on, the script event will activate. If we want to associate our event with a particular elevation level, we need to set its unknown value to that specific elevation plus 1. So, if we only want the event to trigger when the player is on top of the bridge, we need to set the unknown value to 0004, since the elevation around the bridge is of level 3. The result is shown on screen. The player does not activate the event when walking underneath the bridge, but does when walking on top of the bridge. If we only want the event to trigger when the player is below the bridge, then we would set the unknown value to 0003, since the elevation of the lower ground is of level 2. The result is shown on screen. The last error is just a dumb slip up on my part. At any given moment, the player can see exactly 7 tiles to the left, 7 tiles to the right, 5.5 tiles upward, and 5.5 tiles downward. The player's field of view actually consists of 7 tiles left and right, and 4.5 tiles up and down. In that clip I said 5.5 instead of 4.5, however the rest of my explanation in that video is still correct regardless of my mistake. That's everything I wanted to cover in this tutorial. Hopefully you all learned something valuable from this, and if you have any questions, please feel free to ask either over at Poke Community or right here in my video's comment section. Thank you so much for being my audience, and I'll be back in the 14th installment of this series.